I think all of you know who Tess and I are up here on the screen, your executive director and wonderful events coordinator at the Athenaeum of Philadelphia, here to welcome you warmly uh, to our virtual fall speakers series. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Lindsay Travinsky, writes on her website that she believes in the exhilaration of history and devotes her time to sharing this passion with others. Like her, we at the Athenaeum staff and members and board believe that learning, knowledge and engagement with history and literature with ideas and deep questions are the stuff that makes life fabulous. The Athenaeum is thrilled to create opportunities for our members and our friends to dive deep together into our past to learn more, to help us and guide us in our present decisions. We strive to create conversation worthy community strengthening programs so every one of us can feel that thrill of connection we remember during making during our college years, those aha moments when disparate themes and ideas come together. So I'm glad that each and every one of you is here tonight to listen and learn and engage and talk together. If you are a curious attender of Athenaeum programs and not yet a member, I invite you to contact me or Tess after this program to learn more about becoming a vital member of our part of our community as a member, a subscriber or a shareholder. We would love to have you um, deepen that connection. Before we start, uh, before I introduce our, our speaker, who you also see on the screen, I want to remind you that there are a couple little things on the, the Zoom screen that can help you. Um, if you want to just look at who is speaking, I invite you to go up to the upper right-hand corner. You'll see speaker view or gallery view and make sure it says you have speaker view up and that will give you just the speaker and not Tess and I when we're done here. Uh, and and you'll we'll have a, a shared screen. If you have any trouble, sometimes people have trouble seeing the uh, shared screen when it comes up. If that happens, I invite you to log off and then to log back into the program. Tess will let you right back in. Some Usually that will solve the problem is what we found. Uh, so if you have that problem. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see both the Q&A and the chat. You may put questions anytime during Dr. Chavinsky's speech or her talk, I should say, sorry, um, into the chat or the Q&A. And when she's done, we'll moderate those questions and have hopefully a lively discussion together. Now tonight, I'm so delighted to introduce to you Dr. Lindsay Travinsky. We just discovered in talking that uh, I did my undergraduate at University of California, Davis, and she did her PhD there studying with Alan Taylor, who uh, has won multiple Pulitzer Prizes and um, is just an amazing scholar. And she is following in his footsteps and actually making her own path um, as, as a well-respected and well highly regarded scholar of US presidential and cabinet history and US governmental institutions. Uh, Dr. Chavinsky is a scholar in residence at the Institute uh, for Thomas Paine Studies at Iona College and senior fellow at the International Center for Jefferson Studies. She also teaches on the American presidency at the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University. She did postdoctoral work and was uh, at the Presidential Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University, and also served as an historian with the White House Historical Association. She brings all of this um, amazing plethora of, of scholarly work and work as a teacher and an explainer of, of history uh, to her work in her many interviews and podcasts and programs like tonight. She is the author of a book which we are going to be learning more about tonight, The Cabinet, George Washington and the Creation of an American Institution, which was published by Belknap Harvard University Press in April 2020. So we're so delighted to have her here as she um, works on getting the news out about her book and the importance of the cabinet. As someone said earlier in our chat, not all of us know a whole lot about the cabinet or how it came about or what it's supposed to be doing. And so her, her talk about how George Washington helped set the precedent and tone for what a cabinet ought to be and do is gonna be very insightful. I invite you all to join me, though we can't hear you, but to join me in welcoming Dr. Lindsay Travinsky tonight to the Athenaeum. Welcome, we look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you all so much for being here and for your interest in the cabinet. I am delighted to have the opportunity to share more about it and 
why um, hopefully you will be a big fan of cabinets after tonight if you weren't already. So um, as with uh, all things in the pandemic world, um, I'm trying to find some silver linings. And so, you know, one of the, the great opportunities is that I have the ability to speak to people that I wouldn't necessarily get to see on a regular basis. Of course, that um, can get a little bit challenging when I am, you know, sharing the same book each time. So I really like to try and come up with some sort of local flair for every particular talk and honor the virtual hosts. So this is going to be a Philadelphia focused uh, cabinet story this evening. And that will be the way that we narrow in on uh, Washington's cabinet and the origins of that story. So any conversation about the cabinet has to start with the Constitutional Convention, which of course took place in Philadelphia. And the reason it has to start there is because the cabinet is actually not in the Constitution. And that was very intentional. The delegates to the Constitutional Convention explicitly rejected several proposals that would have created an executive council or a cabinet of some kind to advise the president. And in fact, at one point, Charles Pinckney actually put forth a proposal that looked incredibly similar to the cabinet that ended up emerging under Washington's administration and the delegates voted it down. So that is a really important fact when we talk about how the cabinet emerged because it was not guided by the terms in the constitution or any additional legislation, but rather came from a organic um, needs-based development when Washington and the administration were grappling with the day-to-day -day realities of governing. So the delegates to the Constitutional Convention, they rejected a cabinet, but they knew, of course, that a president did need advisors because no one person can be expected to have all of the answers and know everything, and sometimes they need support and advice. So they put in two different options into Article Two of the Constitution. And these phrases are probably pretty, um, pretty common to you all. I'm sure you've read them. But the key part of this phrase is that the president, with the advice and consent of the Senate, will make treaties and foreign appointments. And today in the 21st century, we tend to think of the Senate either as sort of a rubber stamp or a veto on presidential treaty making, foreign policy, and appointments. But at the time in the 18th century, they took that advice component very seriously. And the delegates to the Constitutional Convention, including Washington, who was of course there, understood that the Senate was supposed to serve as a council on foreign affairs. And you might think, well, that's crazy. Who wants a hundred person council? But it's really important to remember that at the time in the fall of 1789, there were only 22 senators seated and they were considered safe advisors because they were indirectly elected and therefore could be removed by the state legislatures in the event that they gave bad advice or encouraged bad policies. So as president of the Constitutional Convention, Washington was there every day. He didn't miss a single session. He heard the delegates discuss these things. He heard them consider the different terms. He socialized with them afterwards. He went to tea and went to the theater and went dancing and listened to music and had dinner and meals. And so he had a very good understanding of what the delegates expected of the first president. And since everyone kind of knew that he was gonna be the first president, he had a very good understanding of what was expected of him. So when Washington got into office, he was inaugurated at the end of April, 1789. Just a couple months later, he started to plan his first visit to the Senate. Of course, at this point, the seat of government is still in New York City. And this is the Senate met on the ground floor of Federal Hall, which is on the corner of Wall Street. Washington sent all of the existing treaties with, between the United States and Native American nations because the thing he wanted to discuss was an upcoming peace commission. And he was sending commissioners and he needed to give them instructions. And that was not something he had done before. So he wanted the Senate's advice. He sent all of the existing treaties. He met with a committee to discuss how he would enter and where he would stand and where he would sit and how he would be introduced and the details that maybe seem kind of silly until you have to do them for the first time. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh my goodness, there are all these things we have to figure out. On the day of his uh, set appointment, which he had announced to the Senate, he brought with him the acting Secretary of War, Henry Knox, 
who had overseen all of those treaties and was there to answer any questions or provide any additional information that the senators might need. When Washington arrived, he had an address with him and then he had a list of questions. And John Adams actually delivered that address as the president of the Senate in his capacity as vice president. After he did so, the senators sat in silence. Some of them sort of fiddled with their papers or twiddled their thumbs or most avoid, avoided eye contact with the president. And it must've been incredibly awkward because we all know how uncomfortable awkward silences can be. So after a couple of minutes, Senator William McClay of Pennsylvania stood up and suggested that they refer the issue to committee so that they could discuss it privately and they would like Washington to come back the next week for their recommendation. Well, most of the time, Washington did a really good job keeping his temper until he didn't. And in this moment, he absolutely lost his mind. And he stood up and he yelled at them, this defeats every purpose of my coming here, except, you know, much taller and louder and scarier because this was the most famous or at least one of the most famous men in the world who had this amazing reputation and he was yelling at you. So he eventually calmed down and he agreed to come back the following week, but on his way out of the Senate chambers, he reportedly said that he would never again return for advice. Now, whether or not he actually said that is not totally clear. The evidence isn't fantastic, but he was definitely thinking it because he never again returned for advice. So in this case, actions speak a lot louder than words. So right away, just a couple of months into his presidency, Washington has basically eliminated one of the key advisory options that the delegates to the Constitutional Convention have laid out for him. So what's the other option? The other option is also in Article 2, and it says that the president can request written advice from the officer of each department on subject remaining to their particular offices. Now, this phrase is crafted incredibly carefully. So first of all, he may require. The president is not obligated to ask for the advice of the department secretaries, and he is not obligated to follow it. Second, that advice is supposed to be in writing so that there is a paper trail of evidence about who said what and who advocated which policy so that the American people can hold the government accountable and responsible. And finally, the advisors are supposed to give advice on their departments and the things they know about so that they can be knowledgeable and experienced advisors because they didn't want people bloviating about subjects that they didn't know anything about. So that was very important. So Washington, initially the house on the far left was the, the residence that he lived in for most of his time in New York City. And then of course the house on the right is where he moved into when the seat of government moved from New York City to Pennsylvania. If we were in a room together, I would ask you to raise your hands if you had visited the site in downtown Philadelphia. I'm sure most of you have where the sort of the, um, the National Park Service site is at the president's house. Unfortunately, of course, the house no longer remains, but I've worked with um, some 3D artists to create a 3D recreation, recreation of what this space might have looked like. So initially when Washington was in New York, he stuck to the letter of that clause. He requested written advice and he exchanged letter after letter after letter after letter with his department secretaries. But as we all know, when we're sending text messages or emails, sometimes things get lost in translation. Tone isn't always clearly conveyed. Maybe you forget to say something or ask a question and you can end up with these giant you know, email chains. But so now imagine trying to do that with parchment and quill and you have to write out your letter, you have to dust it with sand and wait for For it to dry, you have to have it delivered really efficient and he needed a way to have more up to date conversations um, or more minute to minute conversations with the department secretaries so that he could ask follow up questions, get more details or revise any sort of position that they were working on. So when they were at this hat, when he had moved to Philadelphia, he started this new policy where he would exchange a letter or two with the department secretaries and then ask them to come and have a one-on-one -on -one consultation. And um, the room that they met in was Washington's private study. It was on the second floor of the building. It was about 15 by 21 feet. 
by 21st century standards, it would have been very uncomfortably full of furniture because it served multiple purposes. It was Washington's office. It was where he met with his personal secretaries. It was where they did all of their correspondence. But it was also where he got dressed, where he had his hair done in the morning by his enslaved manservant, and where he generally um, you know, took care of his personal business. So it had the dressing table, it had a stove, it had the globe, it had at least three bookcases, it had his giant desk, it was a very full room. But so this is where he would have met one-on-one -on -one with his secretaries. And they did that for two and a half years. And that's really, really important to emphasize because most people see these guys, which from left to right is Washington, Secretary of War, Henry Knox, Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, and Attorney General Edmund Randolph. And they say, okay, well, they were in office from the beginning. Clearly there was a cabinet from the beginning, but that was really not the case. And in fact, the first cabinet meeting did not occur until November 26th, 1791 when Washington brought them together to discuss uh, various different treaties and economic relationships with Spain, France, and Great Britain. And these were such big policies and such big questions that they touched on multiple different departments and he wanted them to come together to get multiple perspectives. So once Washington decided that he in fact needed a cabinet and he needed to have these group meetings, he had to figure out what he was going to do because there had never been a cabinet before and there was no model to really go off of. So what Washington did was he borrowed many of his practices from the British and then his own councils of war during the revolution. He convened councils for a couple of different reasons. Sometimes it was when he was going to make a really unpopular decision or potentially controversial one, like a retreat or abandoning Manhattan. And he wanted to make sure he had his officers in agreement so that he had some political cover. Sometimes it was to build unity or consensus among the officers before entering into a major engagement or selecting winter quarters, which was a very important strategic decision. And sometimes he just wanted advice and he used councils really effectively to get other perspectives, other opinions, or to learn from local inhabitants who might know the land and topography a little bit better than he did. So he met with the, the councils in a couple of different places. Sometimes they met in really grand homes like the Longfellow House, which is still in Cambridge. And sometimes they met in Washington's campaign headquarters. One little fun fact, I'm sure some of you guys have seen the, the tent that is at the Museum of the American Revolution. And maybe they've pointed out to you that the front of the entrance of the tent actually had to be raised because Washington was taller than most men at the time. And so the standard dimensions didn't actually work for him. But when Washington was meeting with his officers, these were not small personalities. And uh, sometimes they were quite energetic and uh, not always easy to manage. So for example, Charles Lee liked to go everywhere with his pack of hounds. And I have an American foxhound and I can tell you that they're not quiet dogs. And when there's a group of them and they are our bane, you can get absolutely zero conversation done. So you can imagine how the councils would have gone when there was a pack of hounds running through the room. So Washington used a couple of strategies to try and manage these really big personalities with really big egos and really big ambitions. First, he sent out a list of questions for them to consider ahead of time and to make sure that they knew what topics he wanted them to be informed about. He then used that list of questions as the meeting's agenda to try and kind of keep everyone on point and focused. And if the officers disagreed, which frankly was more often than not, he would ask for written opinions afterwards to make sure he heard from everyone in case you know someone was feeling a little bit quiet or maybe shouted down by the hounds and they didn't wanna compete. So he wanted to make sure he heard from everyone's opinions. And he also wanted to make sure he had all of the details and the information and he could study that in his own time and quietly and then make a decision. And if that decision was unpopular, he had the written evidence that people had supported him. Now, Washington never actually publicized those written opinions, but it was in his back pocket just in case he needed that option. So when Washington gathered together his secretaries, granted there were fewer of them, there were only four guys, um, and generally they didn't bring their dogs to the cabinet meetings, but they were still very big personalities with their own ideas about how things should go, 
They were accustomed to being listened to. They were used to being right. And um, so you can imagine that it produced a little bit of a tense environment, especially given that by 1792, 1793, when cabinet meetings were really picking up, Jefferson and Hamilton pretty much hated each other. And most of the cabinet meetings generally took place in the summer in this room in Philadelphia with no air conditioning. And the meetings sometimes were hours at a time in, in moments of crisis, like the neutrality crisis, which we're gonna talk about in just a moment. They met up to five times per week. So this room basically acted as a hothouse for political tensions and animosities. So Washington's strategy with trying to manage these people was to do the same thing. He would send out a list of questions ahead of time. He would use those questions as the meeting agenda. And then if they disagreed, which again, more often than not, he would ask them for written opinions and make a decision later. So I just want to talk about um, the neutrality crisis as a great example of, first of all, Philadelphia cabinet experience, and the city actually played a pretty big role in the neutrality crisis, but also how that reflects the cabinet's role in the presidency and Washington's management of it, and then the ongoing evolution of the cabinet afterwards. So just a little primer for those of you who maybe don't remember the neutrality crisis from your high school or college textbook. In February of 1793, France declared war on Great Britain and it quickly spiraled into an international conflict and um, took into account all of their col colonial holdings and their allies and their enemies. And the United States was tasked with trying to stay out of that conflict. So everyone, including Jefferson, who was ardently pro-French, agreed that war was not an option because the country was just beginning to recover from the revolution financially, environmentally, economically, emotionally. And even if they had wanted to fight, they didn't really have an army or navy to do so anyway. So there wasn't anything to really fight with. So they all agreed that neutrality was the best choice. But neutrality is much more complex than just saying, hey, we're staying out of it. There's the domestic side, which is you have to make your citizens sometimes stay out of the fight, which they had never had any experience doing. And if people didn't stay out of it, then you had to bring um, a case against them, but it wasn't clear what court was supposed to hear that decision, who was supposed to enforce it, what law they were breaking. There were all of these legal implications for what domestic neutrality meant. Then there were also a number of foreign implications, which were brought mostly brought forth by the gentleman here in the center of your screen, citizen Edmund Charles Genet, who was the new French minister to the United States. And he arrived just after Washington had issued his proclamation of neutrality and essentially decided to ignore it. And so what he did was he decided he was going to arm a number of privateers to go out and fight for the French. Now, privateers are essentially private ships that are sailed by men that are not involved in the military, but they basically have a license from a foreign power to attack that power's enemies. So for example, Genet would hire Americans to take American ships and go attack the British, capture a British ship, and then bring it back and sell off all the goods, and it would get more money and goods and weapons for the French. So you can imagine how the British felt about this. Not so great. And it was a very common practice. All sides practice privateering, but neutral powers were expected to keep privateers out of their harbors because that was the only way to not play favorites to one side or the other. This is just an example of um, a naval, a naval battle um, roughly around the time. But so what Genet did was he was not only arming French privateers and he was purchasing ships, he was purchasing goods, including weaponry and food and supplies. And then he was going out and he was getting British ships and dragging them back into the port of Philadelphia and selling off the goods and then turning the British ships into new French privateers. Now I've brought up a map of uh, Philadelphia and this map is roughly from 1800, but the architecture would have looked pretty similarly at the time. The star on your left is where the president's house is and that's on the corner of Sixth and Market or Sixth and High Streets. And the star on the right is where the port of Philadelphia was. So you can see it's about six blocks. So Genet was bringing in French privateers and their British captures to the port of Philadelphia, six blocks from Washington's house. And he was basically going like this to the president because there is no more obvious way 
to say, I am ignoring your foreign policy. And all of this, of course, did not go unnoticed by the British minister who also happened to be in Philadelphia. So the cabinet met um, high watermark of 51 times in 1793, as I said, up to five times per week. And eventually they came up with a list of rules of neutrality that would govern um, America's periods of neutrality up to the Civil War. They were codified by Congress the following spring when Congress is in session. And they decided to request the recall of Genet from France because he had disregarded their foreign policy and really disrespected Washington because he threatened to appeal to the American people to overturn Washington's neutral policy, which was considered a huge insult at the time. So when they decided to do that, first of all, the cabinet meeting and the cabinet decision was unanimous, which means that the pro-French Jefferson agreed to request the recall of the French minister. And so that was a huge moment. It was also a huge moment because the United States had never requested the recall of any minister before. And so there was some, some doubt whether or not France would actually comply. And when France did agree to recall Genet, what that meant was France was tacitly agreeing that the new United States had the right to set its own foreign policy and have it be respected by foreign ministers. So that was a big moment. The other big moment happened in the fall when Congress came back into session. Congress had been out of session pretty much all summer and then had had to flee because there was a big yellow fever outbreak in October and September. So foreign policy, of course, when we think about the Constitution, if you go back to that clause that I showed you on the very first slide, Article 2 says that the president is supposed to do that with the Senate. But Washington had issued the neutrality proclamation by himself. And so there, it wasn't totally clear how Congress was going to respond. And Congress didn't really say anything. Congress seemed to be totally fine with this. And in fact, as I said, the following spring, they codified these rules of neutrality and put them into law, which meant that Washington had essentially carved out this whole sphere of influence for the president over diplomacy and foreign policy with the assistance of the cabinet and Congress had agreed to it. So it was a big moment in terms of establishing precedent for the presidency and establishing precedent for the cabinet that the cabinet was going to support the president as opposed to take power away from the president. So you might be thinking, well, yeah, that's nice, Lindsay, but um, the cabinet is much bigger now. It's 2020. There's at least 15 positions. Sometimes there are more people that sit in on the cabinet meetings. There's a National Security Council. So what does that matter? Good question. So at the end of Washington's administration, he actually turned away from cabinet meetings and only held a few in 1796 and early 1797. I suspect that's because the replacements after Washington and Hamilton, or excuse me, Jefferson and Hamilton and Knox and Randolph retired or resigned, the replacements just really weren't up to snuff. I affectionately call them the B team. And we know that Washington didn't think much of them because he often wrote in his letters that they weren't up to the tasks of their office. And he had asked six people before finally settling on Timothy Pickering as his secretary of state. So it's not a great way to start a working relationship. Um, so he, uh, he just didn't think as much of them and he turned away from cabinet meetings in favor of one-on-one -on -one consultations or um, written correspondence or even getting advice from people um, that were outside of the administration like Hamilton or John Jay. But so what that meant was a couple of things. First, the cabinet had no right to be a part of the decision-making process. They were welcome to provide their advice and offer their insight when the president wanted it, but they didn't get to be in the room. Second, the president gets to decide who his closest advisors are going to be. Sometimes they will be in the cabinet. Sometimes they will be former administration officials. Sometimes they will be friends. Sometimes like the case of Kennedy, they will be family members who had his, you know, his brother, Bobby Kennedy, of course, was the attorney general, but was also one of his closest advisors. And so each president gets to decide that for themselves. And those relationships are not determined by legislation. They are not determined by party politics like they are sometimes in Great Britain. And there is very little public or congressional oversight of how those relationships will work. And I would argue that is one of Washington's greatest precedents that is often overlooked. Um, we tend to ignore the cabinet when things are going well. Most of their uh, achievements and successes go to the president's 
um, agenda and the president gets the acclaim. When the cabinet is going poorly, then we do tend to notice news stories about scandal or problems in departments or something like that. But I would argue that the cabinet is actually one of the best ways to understand the presidency and um, to appreciate presidential leadership. So um, I wanted to leave a bunch of time for your questions because I actually think that's the most fun part. I like to know what you want to know more about and be able to address those subjects. But before I do, I wanted to share a little story with you. Um, of course, one of my the things that I'm saddest about, my book came out on April 7th, and so I have yet to been able to meet with readers in person, which um, was not as I intended. So I've come up with a solution, which is, as you can see in this picture, um, personalized book plates. The book plate design is in honor of two things. First, George Washington loved dogs. He absolutely adored them, and he had a ton of them, and he named them funny things like he had a spaniel named Sweet Lips, which I think is hilarious. But he was particularly fond of hounds. And he, in fact, created the American foxhound breed by breeding English hounds with French hounds that were given to him as a gift by the Marquis de Lafayette. My dog pictured here, I rescued when he was a puppy. And I found out later that he is an American foxhound. So it was totally unintentional that I ended up writing a book about Washington and having a foxhound. Um, his name is John Quincy Dog Adams, Quincy for short, but the story gets even better because it turns out, and I, I only learned this like three months ago, the person who brought the French hounds from the Marquis de Lafayette to George Washington was none other than John Quincy Adams. So it is a perfect little story of kismet, but anyway, so if you go to this, the, the point of the story is if you go to this link, um, if you have the book already, or if you're interested in purchasing the book, you can do so through the bookshop link that they will share or any of your favorite book um, sellers, whatever your preference is. And if you go to this link, you can put in your information and I will send you a personalized book plate. Thank you for reading it, for your interest in the cabinet and for coming tonight. So um, thank you again for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Lindsay. This is wonderful. And I remind everybody, if you have questions about Washington's cabinet, about the early years of the government, uh, even broader questions, um, please put them in the Q&A and the chat and um, we'll moderate those questions. Uh, as, as we're waiting for a few questions to come in, I'd love to uh, see if you'd say something about George Washington and his cabinet's role in um, creating the concept of executive privilege and how that plays out. Yes, that is an excellent question. So um, actually the last, I have a couple of case studies in, in the book, chapters six through eight. And the last case study is about the Jay Treaty. And the Jay Treaty was really essential to the creation of executive privilege. Washington and the cabinet had considered it earlier on in the presidency, and they had determined that the president had the right to withhold information if um, security or um, something about safety was in order, but they decided not to because in that particular instance, they felt like um, they could share the information and everything would be okay. That changed in 1796. So the Jay Treaty had arrived in the spring of 1795 and the Senate had ratified it and Washington had taken a while to sign it because he was worried about a couple of clauses in particular. It then went to the House of Representatives because there was a clause that required Congress to create a commission to adjudicate pre-war debts from the revolution. And that of course required money. So the House had to get involved to raise the funds. So most of the Republicans, and these are Democratic Republicans or Jeffersonian Republicans, depending on what language you want to use, um, they hated the treaty and they were looking for any opportunity to scuttle it. And so what they decided to do was to request all written materials pertaining to the Jay Treaty negotiations in the hopes that it might embarrass the administration. And Washington decided not to turn over those materials. And he met with his cabinet. He got their agreement to assert executive privilege. 
And then he wrote, which I think one of what I think is probably the greatest letters in um, uh, American history. It is so full of spunk because not only does he say no, he decides to give them a lesson on American history. And he reminds them that he was at the Constitutional Convention when the delegates decided that only the Senate and the president would be involved in treaty making. And the House had no role in that. And it was inappropriate for them to ask. And if they didn't believe him that he had the journals from the convention in the State Department and they were welcome to come and take a look. So it was kind of like the ultimate mic drop. Um, so, but what's really interesting about that letter, the other part of it, which makes it such an extraordinary document is in addition to asserting executive privilege, Washington says, if this were a matter of impeachment, I would turn the letters over. So he recognized that there were degrees of congressional oversight and a regular oversight committee did not have the same right to executive papers that an impeachment committee would. Thank you. I forgot I was muted still. Um, so we got some more questions coming in. I, I just find that fascinating since we, we, we have heard through so many, you know, administrations, executive privilege being invoked and we don't always understand why that's happening. So that, that was very helpful. Um, so there's a question here, how is the number of cabinet members determined and how often do they change? So that's a great question. So the constitution, as I showed you guys in that, um, that part of article two, it mentions the departments, but it doesn't say how many or what they're going to be or anything else about them. And it leaves it up to Congress to decide. In the first year of Congress, in the summer of 1789, Congress decided to create three departments state, war, and treasury, and then created the attorney general, which was really more of like a constitutional advisor to the other secretaries and to the president. The secretary of the Navy was added under President Adams' administration, and then a couple more were added in the 19th century, but then we really saw an expansion around um, the New Deal and World War II. So Congress is the one that decides. So for example, the Department of Homeland Security was a relatively recent innovation after September 11th. It was thought that maybe putting a bunch of different security forces in one under one sort of tent would help improve security, especially around the borders. Um, so Congress can create or dismantle departments as they see fit. Um, there haven't been, I think my understanding is that was the, the most new one, although I might not be 100% right on that. Um, but at any time they can create or dismantle a department. So related to that then, as, as you spoke about Washington and determining who he would speak to for advice, is the president required to have all of the department heads on his or her cabinet? So um, certain positions are designated as cabinet level positions. So, you know, all of the department heads are designated the UN, the ambassador to the UN, the national security advisor, usually the chief of staff. More recently, the vice president has become an official part of the cabinet, but that was much more an aberration than the rule early on. But the president isn't really required to talk to them. So, I mean, most presidents convene regular and I say regular, I mean like maybe quarterly cabinet meetings because it's a good look to appear to be meeting with your cabinet. Um, but of course they talk with some of the secretaries much more than that. It just depends on their personal relationship. It also depends on how the president runs his White House and hopefully someday her White House. Um, does the chief of staff allow certain secretaries immediate access? Is one of the secretaries really good friends with the president? So of course, um, uh, Jim Baker was really good friends with George H.W. Bush and had been his chief of staff before becoming his secretary of state. So he had his personal number and could just call directly and the chief of staff had no ability to control those conversations whatsoever. So it really depends on the personal relationships and how the White House is structured. Thank you. And do you see a relationship with the stability of the president's cabinet over a given term and the success of implementing an agenda? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, so generally speaking, and this is not a, re a political reflection in any way of our current moment, but generally speaking, administrations that have less turnover and less scandal get more things done. Um, and that makes sense, right? I mean, that's kind of common sense about, you know, 
same would be true for any organization or business, having institutional knowledge, having not having to constantly look for new people to fill an office, especially at that level, there aren't that many people that can be the Secretary of State. So it's hard to fill those positions and it can take a while for them to get up and running. So especially in the 20th century and in the 21st century, we generally see stable administrations have one big set of turnovers, usually around the end of the first term. Um, it's expected that secretaries will deliver their resignations and then the presidents can accept them or not, depending on what they see fit for going forward. Um, but it's also, it's really hard work. So not too many people want to stick it out for eight years. But the more turnover we have, the generally the more chaotic the administration is. So a great example is Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson went through three cabinets, three complete turnovers, because he couldn't find people that were yes men. And he really wanted people who would just do whatever he said. And it took him three whole consecutive turnovers to find that that um, assessment. And that was really chaotic and really crazy and generally didn't reflect well in the administration. Thank you. Um, here's another interesting question. Was there anyone that was a key outside advisor, later known as the kitchen cabinet, who Washington looked to for advice? Yes. So um, they didn't really consider them the kitchen cabinet because the kitchen cabinet usually uh, reflects the understanding that there's like this whole other group of people that are maybe weight, um, wielding influence and that maybe the president prefers. So um, Jackson had a kitchen cabinet, uh, Kennedy had a kitchen cabinet, a couple of others have as well. Uh, so Washington did continue to consult with John Jay, both when he was the chief justice and then afterwards when he was a private citizen and the governor of New York. They had been friends beforehand and Jay had served as the acting foreign secretary until Jefferson could take over the, the secretary of state position, which wasn't until January of 1790. So they had a very close relationship and Washington really liked to run things by him and encourage the secretaries to run things by him as well, which they did because they were also close. So that was a big example. Um, John Adams, who was the vice president, Washington asked him for some input very early on in the presidency. And then again, later in the presidency in like 1795, 1796, and that was through writing. There is no evidence that he ever attended a cabinet meeting. Um, there's no evidence that Washington ever invited him. So he definitely kept him at arm's length, but it is possible they socialized regularly. So they went to the theater together. Adams frequently attended dinner at Washington's house. They would go see local gardens, things like that. So it is possible that they talked about some things. We just don't have any evidence about what that conversation was. Were there a follow up there? Were there concerns about conflict of interest with, with the president turning to John Jay, the head of Supreme Court, um, for his advice? Yes, that's a really interesting question. The, the concept of conflict of interest and separation of powers was still kind of getting worked out. And sometimes people were much more sensitive about it than others. So there didn't seem to be any issue with Washington talking to Jay individually. And Jay didn't seem to have any problem giving that advice or even acting as he went to Great Britain to negotiate Jay's treaty while he was still Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So he had no problem kind of wearing multiple hats. Um, at one point, Washington asked the entire Supreme Court about their opinion about various legal questions surrounding neutrality in 1793. And the court basically said that they could not discuss it as a group because it would be inappropriate because that would be a conflict. But Jay continued to provide one on one advice. So it seemed that they drew a distinction between the court as a whole and then one on one. Thank you. Um, now, this one is a question about Janae's privateering. Uh, wondering if your study of Janae's privateering indicated that the British ships actually sailed to the city port rather than being stopped at Fort Mifflin, which became the city's first immigration port of entry for most ships. Um, so uh, let me make sure I understand the question. Are they saying that they sailed into the port as opposed to stopping at the fort? I think that's the question. Jean, if you wanna clarify. I'm guessing that's what 
Um, so I, I have no idea. That is a really interesting question. Um, the only records of the British ships that I found um, were, I mean, they, they were coming and going from ports like French ships were too, to get, it was deemed neutral behavior to get sort of basic supplies like food and water and blankets and clothing. And so they were doing the same thing. Um, and they were permitted to do so, but they, there isn't as much record keeping about them bringing in privateers. So I don't know if that's more of the, where the question is getting at, but um, I'd be happy to look into it. That's an interesting question. Um, so this one is interesting too. Uh, in any presidents in our history who lost control of their cabinet, meaning really their cabinet controlled them? Yes. So there are a couple of really interesting um, examples. So um, poor John Adams. Uh, I have a soft spot in my heart for John Adams, but, and he had the very best of intentions. But if you think about what he was, the situation he was facing, it was really not fair because he was going second after Washington and Washington at this point was by far and away the most famous person in the world and really well respected, even though he had received some political criticism um, towards the end of his administration, once he decided to retire, then everyone basically universally adored him. And so Adams, not only did he not really compare physically in stature, he didn't really compare in terms of reputation. So that was just going to be unfair from the beginning. Not to mention the transition of power was incredibly scary because that had never happened before. And in the 18th century, transitions of power were usually accompanied by a revolution, a guillotine, death, lots and lots of drama. And so he was trying to provide a peaceful transfer of power. And he thought a great way to do that would be to provide some continuity and institutional knowledge by maintaining Washington secretaries. Now keep in mind, this is the B team secretaries. And he thought that they would be loyal to the office of the presidency. And it turned out they were loyal to Hamilton. So they worked pretty hard to undermine pretty much everything he tried to do from uh, diplomatic policy to his reelection campaign. And it wasn't until the summer of 1800 when he kind of cleaned house that he was able to regain control. Another example is James Madison. James Madison had a very strict construction interpretation of how the president was supposed to manage the executive and he was incredibly hands-off and he kind of let the cabinet absolutely run roughshod over his um, administration and the war efforts and everything else. Um, one interesting sort of counter historical example, for a long time people thought that Eisenhower's cabinet completely ran him and that he was kind of old and doddering and he just played golf and he didn't really know anything. And then in the last 10, 15 years, um, historians and archivists and librarians have declassified all of this information as is sort of the normal course. And it turns out that he was actually on top of everything. And he was super knowledgeable and super aware of all of the details. And he kind of cultivated this senile impression because it served his foreign policy purposes, but he was actually super on top of it. So are there, um, are there examples besides George Washington of, of folks who had really effective president cabinet relationships? Yes, there are some good, really good examples. So um, Monroe is an interesting example because his cabinet was um, sort of divided in the same way that Washington's ended up being and that there were a lot of political rivals in it. Of course, they were all technically Republicans at this point. It was the era of good feelings, um, which is the most hilariously named uh, thing ever because they often hated each other. So he had people like John Quincy Adams and Calhoun who were you know, going to be competing or eventually on the opposite side of the Civil War um, and the Civil War concept in the same cabinet. But he was able to actually um, sort of maintain that and keep it under control. Lincoln, of course, uh, had a very effective cabinet, which Doris Kearns Goodwin has written about in Team of Rivals. Uh, they were also political rivals, and he was able to make the most of that situation. FDR had a fantastic cabinet. So FDR cultivated chaos and often would play his cabinet secretaries off of each other to see who could come up with the best solution, and he would give them the same problem to fix and see who could do what with it. 
but that worked for him. Um, that requires a particular personality to be able to keep people in line and to be able to manage that level of chaos, but he was able to do so quite well. Um, he also did something really interesting during the war years, which was that he appointed Republicans to key war positions like the Department of State and the Department of War. And they, of course, disagreed on social policy and on economic policy, but they agreed on war policy. And so they were able to find an area where their values overlapped enough that they could work together and he could have a unified cabinet during the war years. Um, in more recent administrations, and I, I should be very clear that when I am discussing what are good cabinets and bad cabinets, I'm not saying that I agree or disagree with policy. I'm talking about how they operate as a working group. Um, Obama actually had a really effective cabinet. There was very little turnover. Um, there was very little scandal. Uh, they seem, of course, a lot of stuff hasn't been declassified yet, so I'm sure we will learn more with the most recent administrations when that happens, but they seemed to work together pretty well as a group. I think we have one last question here. Uh, who do you think was the most, uh, is the most interesting uh, member of Washington's cabinet? Mm. So we, talk, we were talking about this a little bit as we started. I really like studying Henry Knox and Edmund Randolph because I think that their story is a little bit harder to get at. They didn't have a public service career after they left the cabinet. Um, Randolph was an attorney for a long time after that, but had sort of resigned in disgrace. And Knox went back to Maine and desperately sort of to, needed to get his personal finances in order. But their cabinet experience was much more wrapped up in their personal loyalties to Washington and their relationship with him as opposed to conflicting views of what the nation should be like Jefferson and Hamilton who had very clear political ambitions and ideas for the future of the nation that they then fought over after the, their cabinet time. So I think it's really fascinating to try and get a sense of what their relationships were like what their loyalties were like. And because they really weren't as famous, there isn't as much material available. So Knox's papers have been relatively well cata um, cataloged and categorized, but Randolph's have kind of been scattered everywhere. And so it's much harder to get sort of a pulse on who they were. Um, and I like that challenge. So I find them sort of perplexing and interesting and those personal dynamics to be really compelling. Thank you. Um for everybody who was here, this was just a really interesting and lively uh, lecture. And uh, I think we all learned a lot. I hope everyone will purchase Lindsay's book. As she noted, uh, you can get a book plate signed uh, by Lindsay uh, for your book. If you buy it through bookshop.org, a portion of those funds go to support the Athenaeum. Another, the rest of it goes to support independent bookstores everywhere. Um, directly to them. So I hope you will consider them as a resource for buying your book. I wanted to remind you that as we round out October, we have Carl Rawlison talking tomorrow about his two volume William Faulkner, Faulkner um, biography. And we have multiple concerts through Allegro Presents, little chamber concerts in our space. It will not be crowded like that. Maximum tickets are 20 people um, for each concert to be there live. Uh, or you can live stream. We have uh, uh, Leo Damrosh has been many times we've had to reschedule him. So we're glad that he will be with us virtually to talk about his book, The Club, Johnson Boswell and the Friends Who Shaped an Age. And also not on there next Tuesday at noon is my book reading group, uh, Books with Beth, looking at um, James Baldwin's The Fire Within or The Fire Next Time, sorry. The fire next time. So I hope you'll join me for that conversation. Join us for these programs and in programs going on throughout November and into December. I hope you will join us uh, in thanking Lindsay for a wonderful conversation and we will see you all again next time. <laughs>